Hi, this is Terry Keane from the American Psychological Foundation. Um, as many of you know, I am the uh, president this year, and I'm very, very pleased that uh, we've been able to um, attract um, a series of really very special presenters, psychologists who are working and are thinking a lot about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think today we have a particularly important presentation from Dr. Jay Van Babel from New York University, where he is an associate professor in psychology and neurosciences. Um, I think the um, presentation that we will be hearing, at least in part, is one that has been presented to the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. I think that um, uh, the, the important part of this presentation is that we at APF are interested in maintaining um, contact with all of our stakeholders, people who receive our grants and people, um, and, and people who are our benefactors. And I think today we have many people from each of these categories. I'm happy to say that uh, Jay Van Bevel from NYU is a recipient of the Visionary Award um, from 2015 or 16, if I recall correctly. Um, and his work is deeply impressive from a social neuroscientist perspective. I think it's um, valuable for us to understand that psychology is contributing worldwide to efforts to manage this pandemic in ways that um, I think are novel and unique. And I think today we'll hear from, from Jay some of the very interesting and innovative approaches that he has pioneered in his work at, at the NYU. Jay received his doctoral degree from the University of Toronto in Ontario. Um, and he completed a postdoc at Ohio State University before joining NYU's faculty in 2010. And with that very brief um, um, presentation, uh, let me turn it over to Dr. Jay Van Babel. Jay. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I've been a grateful recipient of support from the APF in the past. And it's been uh, incredibly helpful in getting some of my projects off the ground, especially to collect pilot data in those initial stages. So I'm excited to tell you about uh, really cutting edge work that we're doing. And by cutting edge, I mean, it's happening in real time. Um, this paper hasn't even come out yet that I'm gonna present to you, but it has been accepted and it's now in press at Nature Human Behavior and should come out any day, uh, hopefully this week. And I presented some of this at the World Health Organization last week, but it's one of those things that obviously has uh, an immediate relevance. What we're trying to do here is bring together people across the social behavioral sciences. Um, and what I did when I realized there was a major need for this was reach out to a collaborator of mine. He's in sociology at Stanford. His name is Rob Willer. And we invited pretty much overnight, put together a team of uh, 40 authors. And we asked them all to weigh in on different elements of social and behavioral science that we thought uh, were urgently relevant to the COVID pandemic response. And, over a week, we wrote an entire paper that would normally take us six months or a year. And then we got reviews back in a week and made another round of revisions in a week and, and had it accepted right away. And so our paper is circulating. I'm, I've included links to it uh, on several of the slides. I'm just gonna give you the highlights and then take your questions and lead discussion after. So with that, I wanna go back 100 years to a paper that came out in Science Magazine following the Spanish flu. And they basically had a piece published in the magazine talking about what the lessons were from that pandemic. And it turns out that the current pandemic has a lot of similar contours to the Spanish flu. So it turns out to provide a lot of important lessons and guidelines to look back on what was learned there. So three of the lessons that came out of that pandemic that were uh, captured in this paper was that people do not appreciate the risks they run, in part because uh, many people are asymptomatic or they're often most contagious when they're infected, but pre-symptomatic, and the disease is invisible, or the virus is invisible that leads to the disease. And so people don't real realize the risks they are causing others or the risks they run to themselves. And so that introduces a lot of important psychological questions about what can we do with people who don't understand the risks they run, which makes it very different from other types of uh, viruses or diseases. The second lesson from that pandemic was that it really goes against human nature for people to shut themselves up in rigid isolation as a means of protecting others. And so if you even think to many of the instances that come to your mind when you think of 
being helpful or pro-social, they almost always will involve reaching out to help someone. Um, you know, helping someone across the street or lift something heavy or being at someone's bedside when they're sick or distressed. Um, what we need to do to prevent the spread of the current pandemic and the Spanish flu as well was exactly the opposite. It was to completely avoid people and contact with them and isolate ourselves. And so again, this goes against our social nature as, uh, as a very social form of primate, but also um, in terms of what comes to mind, the schemas and, and habits and practices we normally have for helping others. And then finally, the third lesson that they concluded from the previous pandemic was that people often unconsciously act as a continuing danger to themselves and others. And again, the unconscious thing is this might not be happening in our awareness. We're often unaware of all these things. And so that introduces all kinds of other problems, this aspect of it that's unconscious. And that turns out to be something psychologists have been talking about for 100 years. Um, and so as many of you are intimately familiar now, if you've been reading the news, um, there are all these graphs from epidemiologists and public health experts floating around. And they're premised on the idea that we need to do things to flatten the curve. And as you know, um, certainly in many countries right now, we're doing that. We're trying to stop the spread and flatten the curve. And to do that, if you look at the bottom of this figure, um, what they're talking about is a collective response. We need everybody to do their part, whether washing their hands, working from home, canceling trips. Um, all of these types of things are necessary at a broad level of the population for this to be successful and for us to pull it off. The second thing you noticed is that this needs to be sustained, that you can't simply have this happen for a short period of time. If people revert to their old habits and patterns and behavior, you get a recurrence of the event. And this is also what you saw during the Spanish flu pandemic. So what can we do? Who knows about how to manage collective responses? Um, and so even though epidemiologists uh, can create these models based on uh, an r naught or contagion effect, um, they know attack rates, mortality rates, and they have these uh, competing but pretty elegant mathematical models. Um, social and behavioral scientists have insights about what we can do to motivate people to engage in these collective responses that flatten the curve. And so that's where we come in and we think our goal is not to challenge or critique epidemiologists. Our goal is to provide a complement, a set of insights from the last hundred years of our research to help provide the right messages and guidance and persuasive tools uh, to get through to people to engage in these collective responses that our colleagues in epidemiology have outlined are critical. So psychologists don't usually study washing hands, but we study things like science communication or persuasion. And so what we did was we collated uh, what we thought were pretty much the world's leading experts on all the topics, or most of the topics that came to our mind as uh, relevant, and I'll talk about them here. So this is essentially a roadmap of our paper. Um, if you want to read the paper, I've included the preprint below that you can download and, and get into the nitty gritty and the details. Um, but I'm just going to give you an overview of it. Uh, basically, this is like an infographic, just kind of highlighting the core themes. And so we really had six different overarching topics or sections that we discussed. Uh, the first was threat perception. And in the threat perception we, section, we not only talked about how people perceive and react to threats, uh, but when they're overconfident and they misperceive threats. We talk about biases in a risk perception and how sometimes powerful emotional uh, information can override our numerical capacity to understand and evaluate uh, real risks to us. We talked about the consequences for things like prejudice and discrimination, that uh, in particular, there is a long history uh, dating back to the bubonic plague of uh, punishing and discriminating against groups that we thought were associated with transmission. And there are arguments, again, from evolutionary biology and psychology that pathogen avoidance is one of the core motivators behind different types of discrimination. And if you look around the world right now, um, this is manifesting in different ways. Um, in some places in America, it's manifested in anti-Chinese or anti-Asian prejudice. Um, in other countries, it's manifested in things like anti-Italian prejudice or even anti-American prejudice. And so it really depends on where you live and who's most likely to be are stereotyped as being most likely to uh, spread the disease. Then we included a section on disaster and panic. This is something you might have seen in the news a lot lately, uh, pictures or social media pictures of uh, toilet paper missing from stores 
And there are a lot of supply chain, chain uh, challenges right now going on around that, but there's an additional psychological element that when you see those, how do you react? And it turns out that we have a narrative of panic, that in crises, people panic, looting starts and things like this. Um, what we point out is if you look across a lot of different disaster events, panic is actually pretty rare. And yet it's something that the media a lot likes to um, characterize. The problem of course, is that if the media represents people as panicking or we do by showing empty uh, um, aisles in the grocery store, it means that other people are more likely to go and hoard supplies just rationally in response to what they think are scarcities. And so we talk about managing that psychology and understanding the panic is actually not the normal response and also what needs to be communicated to mitigate it from actually happening. Um, we also have a section on leadership, which is critical. So we looked at some of the lessons from previous pandemics like Ebola and uh, looked at the key role of trust in certain communities and how you can uh, work with local authorities, community organizations and leaders to get uh, information out and ensure compliance with health practices. We talk a lot about the language and goals of identity leadership. So what leaders can do to get everybody on board and avoid fragmentation or disinformation campaigns. And we talked about what leaders can do specifically to uh, promote and benefit their in-group um, without disparaging or harming out-groups or closing them off. Um, as you can tell from the authors on our paper, um, we're firmly in the belief that you need to collaborate across disciplines, uh, nationalities to solve this problem. And you can see this in the medical science community. Uh, you, you don't want a situation where one country gets the vaccine and then doesn't share it with any other countries or sells it at incredible prices where most people can't buy it. And so you really need to think about how you can promote cooperation success within a group without harming your relationships with other groups for all these reasons. Um, and then that is related to our section on uh, aligning individual and collective interests. Um, people, some people default into a zero sum thinking um, that I, you know, if I'm gonna get the groceries, then you can't, or if you get them, I won't be able to get them. Um, one challenge in a pandemic is that if we put other people at risk um, by hoarding things, for example, um, we eventually will be at greater risk because if their health, basic health needs can't be met, they're very likely to pass it on into people in their community who eventually will come in contact with people in our community and us. So we're only a few steps removed from most people. And so what we need to do is optimize ways of managing everybody's best interest to not only protect everybody uh, as a moral imperative, um, but to protect ourselves. And again, that goes against people's intuitions a lot of time about how to manage resources. Uh, we often think in very zero sum ways of thinking. Um, we also talk about the roles of moral decision making. So when hospitals, for example, are overburdened, uh, doctors and medical administrators have tricky decisions about how to allocate ventilators and other resources and beds and treatment. And so we talked about the trade-offs inherent in those types of issues and what you can do to uh, maintain trust in medical authorities uh, while allocating resources fairly and what people's intuitions are that might make it challenging to do that. Uh, we also talk about how to promote cooper cooperation. Um, you know, if again, if you can make people feel like they're all in it together, you can use role models to our cooperators. Um, those are things that trigger other people to think cooperation is normative and engaging cooperation. Uh, that, of course, is related to the broader issue of science communication. We talked about the huge problem with growing numbers of conspiracy theories about COVID-19 and fake news. Um, you're seeing some of this around certain medical treatments. In, uh, there's an article in the New York Times this weekend about uh, the, the belief that 5G wireless networks are causing COVID-19. In Britain alone, this has led to 100 attacks on uh, internet networks. And so there's a lot of problems with that. First of all, it means that people aren't taking the proper health steps to protect their health and their communities. It also means that they're potentially destroying internet, which is the main thing keeping people with access to information, with social contact, with the ability to work from home and social distance. And so those types of conspiracy theories can be incredibly dangerous. There's many others I could get into. And then finally, we talked about how to persuade people using good, the good science on uh, persuasion and effective science communication. Talked about using uh, trustworthy sources, engaging with the public in ways that are likely to be effective and strong messaging. Um, 
one thing we talked about in, in some depth was a lot of the different social and cultural factors in the context that make it maybe easier for these messages to get through or harder. And so we talked about social norms in different communities and how they can be leveraged to promote healthy messages. For example, by framing a message as people in your community are already doing this is more likely to be effective than saying, no one's doing this, but you should do it. Um, and so people often have bad intuitions about norms, communication. We talked a lot about social inequality and, and uh, race and ethnicity and how those are related to economic inequality and other aspects to resources and systemic barriers. Um, you can see this, for example, I live in New York. And right now in New York, if you look at where the uh, attack rates and mortality rates for COVID-19 are highest, are in poor ethnic neighborhoods. These are people who don't have as much access to uh, uh, the healthcare system, are poor, are living together, are working in frontline jobs where they're at incredible risk. And so uh, COVID is ravaging a lot of these communities. The death rates, mortality rates much higher, for example, among the African American community than the white community or the Asian community. And so these are things that are just fundamental, uh, not only in our country, but in many other countries around the world. And you have to understand them well about how to promote and support these communities, um, not only to help them again, but with the pandemic, helping the least among us helps all of us. And so this is something that is a really fundamental challenge for our government right now. Um, another issue we talked about is culture. So if you look at around the world at the rate of uh, spread, you'll notice that a lot of countries that have been able to manage the spread more effectively are Asian cultures. Um, and so the question is why? So some, some evidence suggests that maybe they have more experience from SARS and MERS. And so they've been able to manage this better. They have different cultural practices around wearing face masks. Uh, I just saw a few minutes ago that uh, the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, just mandated face mask uh, wearing. But this has been happening in, in Asian cultures for a long time. Um, the other thing that people, our, our paper speculates about the role of individualism and collectivism. Um, the pandemic requires a collectivist response and sacrifices. Cultures that are able to do that might be more effective. Um, there also is a consequence maybe for our norms that in cultures that have dealt with huge threats, norms tighten up. And you can see this right now in people shaming people for not engaging in certain behaviors, um, expecting, demanding a lot of others and enforcing norms in a very rigid way. Um, so tightness of culture can be helpful. We live in a very loose culture, for example, in North America, um, but that might change as a function of the pandemic. So the last issue we talk about and one that I study myself is the role of polarization. Um, it, our thinking is that we have uh, historically high rates of polarization in the US. Um, we are not alone. Many other countries are highly polarized right now. And the US is actually not the global leader by any stretch of the imagination. The problem with polarization is if groups of huge groups of people don't trust the same leaders or authorities or think that a lot of the mainstream news is fake news and they tune out, they're not gonna get proper health information. They're gonna put themselves at risk. And again, then that puts everybody else at risk. So thinking about how to communicate in polarized contexts, uh, we believe is critical. And we've seen a lot of data on that in the United States and other countries are seeing it as well. Um, finally, there's issues of stress and coping. So as you move into issues of uh, flattening the curve through physical distancing, people can get socially isolated. There is an enormous amount of research from the last 20 years showing that isolation is um, terrible for your mental and physical health. One study suggests that loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking. So there is a huge problem with loneliness that exists in society already. It's especially concentrated among elderly people who are at highest risk for, for COVID. And so we need to think of ways to promote connection through online means and, and other means. Um, we also talk about the language that maybe we should not be using terms like social distancing because they might imply that people should um, avoid social contact. What we might, what we recommend is using terms like physical distancing, which imply you can, should, and can maintain a social relationship with people, just be physically distant from them while you do it. We also talk about the challenges for intimate relationships. So some people have seen the spike in divorce data from China. Um, many people are not used to living in minute to minute contact with their spouse or their family. Um, another thing that some uh, scholars have seen is increase in uh, spousal abuse and domestic violence. Uh, and so there are huge challenges. Uh, there's also some data that suggests that 
many uh, relationships actually get better under isolation. Um, but what you tend to see is that uh, people in problematic relationships, things get wor worse. People in great relationships, if anything, it can be a connecting opportunity. Um, but just to understand those dynamics is really critical for what's happening inside the home for uh, billions of people around the globe right now. And then the last thing we talk about is healthy mindsets, how people can frame up to think about the situation in a way that promotes their mental and physical well-being. Um, obviously, if you're in a mode of panic all the time, that's not healthy. Um, it might be functional and useful to a degree that you engage in protective behaviors, but beyond that, it can actually impair your mental and physical well-being. And so we talk about ways to um, manage stress as you're dealing with all these challenges. The next thing we talk about at the end of our paper is we try to have some pull out uh, quotes or implications that we think that the public and policymakers can use directly. Uh, one is that if you can build a sense of uh, shared identity in a community or a culture or a nation, it can be helpful. Um, some research suggests you can do that by using and referring to the public and collective terms like us or we, um, and by urging people to act for the common good. There's some evidence now that people are more likely to engage in health behaviors if they think they're helping other people, um, not just framing it in terms of their own self-interest. The other key thing, as I mentioned about leadership, is identifying sources who are credible to different audiences to share public health. And you've seen that in the US with Anthony Fauci, who goes on, he's the main medical contact right now leading uh, the response in the United States. Um, he has gone on YouTube channels because it turns out younger people, especially Gen Z, and millennials get a lot of their information from watching YouTube. Um, I don't watch YouTube that much, um, but you need to think of who are the people in those communities that you wanna reach. And if you wanna reach young people, you've gotta find means to do it. If you wanna reach people in older communities, you might need to get religious leaders on board. If religious leaders are trying to just hold regular ceremonies um, and they're not presenting this health information in a way that's helpful, it could undercut public health. And so you need to get them on board too and if they are gonna hold remote services, or I saw some services on Easter drive-throughs, um, embedding these public health messages with those leaders can get the message out in a powerful way to those people. The other thing we talked about is the need to use in-group models um, because people get norms from in-group members, not out-group members. And it also helps if you embed these norms and practices in people who are well-connected. So epidemiologists have studied how well-connected individuals can spread a disease. So people who are at the hubs of social networks, uh, the famous one, famous example is Typhoid Mary, who spread typhoid uh, among many people, was asymptomatic, but was moving along people. There's some super spreaders who've been covered in the news in different countries who've been spreading COVID-19. Um, and so we understand how they spread the disease, but they are also incredibly powerful for spreading the right uh, norms. So if you get influential people at the hubs of social networks, and get them practicing and role modeling the right norms are gonna be more effective. And then the other key thing is you need them to be accompanied by social approval. So you don't just need, pe people don't just respond to norms. They want to see norms that are rewarded. And so finding ways to reward and value those people publicly who are doing the right thing is also how norms spread. So just doing those three things with norms uh, basically can supercharge their impact. We also looked at the research on fake news and we found it might be helpful to make people aware that they um, benefit from others' access to preventative measures. Again, this is related to the notion of zero sum thinking. You want people to be aware that if they allocate resources evenly so other people can social distance, it reduces the risk for their whole community, which helps them and their family. Um, and so again, finding ways to get those messages across that people realize helping others helps themselves um, and that their individual goals are aligned with uh, collective and community goals is key. Another thing we talk about is preparing people to encounter misinformation. Um, if you don't prepare people for it, when they encounter it, they might be more convinced. And so there's research suggesting that you can inoculate people against misinformation by preparing them to, by having them encounter it in small doses and giving them accurate information and strong counter arguments against it. So not only are they inoculated against counterinformation, just like a flu shot inoculates against you, you against the flu, um, being exposed with a small dose of uh, counter argument um, or misinformation with plus counter arguments can build up your kind of mental antibodies to fight uh, misinformation when you encounter it and also to share that with others. And as I mentioned before, we should think about the language around 
the practices we want to promote um, because we need to manage social connection and support through this situation. And so moving from terms like social distancing to physical distancing uh, might help make sure that people engage in the health behavior we want without harming their mental health and also making it more socially uh, sustainable for longer periods. If we want people to socially distance for more than a few weeks, we need to take a long-term view of this issue. How are we gonna help them socially distance for months or maybe much longer than that, as we're starting to see from some models? So that is all the key points from that first paper, which is really just a review of all the literature that we thought was relevant. Um, of course, we've only started to learn about COVID-19 and we're starting to do research on it in social and behavioral sciences. Um, but there's not a lot of data yet, and a lot of data is from individual labs. Um, some of it's, a lot of it's as usual in psychology with convenience populations like undergraduate students or simple online samples. So this is a new project I'm launching. We, uh, I just launched it this weekend, and I posted an invitation around the globe for people to join me in studying uh, all of these factors that I just mentioned, or most of these factors to understand what predicts the prevention of uh, COVID-19 around the world. And what we're hoping to do is get people from around the world to complete a set of surveys in representative samples. Um, and so we can bring all the data together rapidly. Our goal is to get it together within two weeks and make it publicly available. So scholars and public health experts from around the world can use it to see what are risk factors predicting uh, exposure to COVID-19, what are factors that uh, predicts um, actual good public health behaviors so we can target populations and identify ways to communicate with them. Um, and so we already have, as of yesterday, 39 different countries have signed on board to collect representative samples. We have 128 research teams in these countries who are working together to collect samples of at least 500 people in each country around the world. We believe this is the largest study of human morality um, and social psychology potentially ever. Um, we're, we don't exactly know what our final sample would be, but I suspect we have a chance of being the largest study ever and also the fastest because we're gonna put this together as quick as we can. And so what we're trying to do is get support right now and funding to line this up, but, but we are moving forward with it and, and sharing all the resources and expertise we can to translate the materials. Right now in real time, we're, we're creating the and finalizing the materials to launch it. Um, so this is the type of stuff that we're doing and other countries are doing, but we're in keeping with the point about cooperation. Um, this is what we're trying to do. It's really a different model of science than how I've ever done science. Most of my career is you run a small studies in your lab and you try to replicate it and then publish it. We're really rethinking how we do science here. And I think this is not just going to be a massive sea change uh, for how we think about issues like this pandemic. Um, but I think it's going to be a tipping point in how we think about doing science going forward. So um, it's a frenetic time. Uh, it's a scary time for a lot of people, but it's also, I, I'm hopeful that it's an exciting time. So with that, I'm just going to acknowledge my authors, my co-authors on our uh, paper, Nature, Human Behavior, and then I'm going to take questions. So I see a question came in from Kate Brown. What gaps in our psychological science would be helpful for the scientific community to address to aid our responses to COVID-19? Um, I actually think, what, what we try to lay out some of this in our paper. Um, what I think is there's a lot of gaps. And so we did our best to put together what we thought were the best possible pieces of data. Um, what I will say, and it came clear as we did it, is as we're trying to draw inferences, a huge challenge is that a lot of our studies are based on convenience samples, uh, largely in North America or Western Europe, and largely at wealthy elite universities. And so when you're studying that, I'll just speak for myself, when I do studies at New York University with undergrads, I'm looking at 18 to 19 year olds who are highly educated, very wealthy um, from an urban environment. And so if you think of what are the risk factors for COVID-19, we know it's older people, largely over 65, who are more likely to be hospitalized or have high mortality rates. Um, it actually tends to be men who are more at risk too, especially older men. And it's often poor minority communities. And so those are all communities that are vastly underrepresented at the universities where we collect most of our data and do our research. And so that's why I think that most of our research on this is speculative. We expect a lot of it will hold um, because a lot of it's been done in many labs uh, in many places. 
but we, we think there's massive gaps, especially rep an understanding, especially of these particular populations and what the factors are that might put them at risk. Um, I'll just give you an example. So uh, I do research on fake news and misinformation. We talk a lot about how the internet is a source of a lot of misinformation and fake news spreading. And young people are mostly on the net internet, so we conclude that they're spreading and exposed to fake news. Um, well, there's a research on people's actual sharing on Facebook before the last uh, 2016 presidential election. And uh, it was a collaborator of mine at NYU. Uh, and what he found was that people over 65 were seven times more likely to share fake news, real fake news, uh, than people under 25. And so the risk factors for sharing that information are radically different than the samples we study. Um, and it turns out those are also people who vote at much higher rates. And so if we think about how we're gonna deal with things like fake news, we need data on those samples and we just simply cannot get them in the way that we normally do research at universities. So again, I think this is just a pervasive issue, but I think it's particularly relevant to COVID. Um, uh, so I'll take the next question from Dorothy. It says, Tom Friedman, uh, at the New York Times is likely to write about and support this work. I have a good connection to Biden and maybe he would get behind this. Um, I would be happy to con talk with you, Dorothy. I actually am talking to uh, the Congressional and Senatorial Science Committee tomorrow and the World Health Organization. So I'm doing my best to get this out there, but I would be happy to talk to anybody uh, at the New York Times. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll follow up with a phone call. <laughs> you gave me your number. So thank you for that. Any, any work, anything we can do to communicate this in ways that can help uh, share the information, but uh, move the conversation forward in a way that's helpful, productive, but also anchored in data, I think is the best bet. Um, Helen also m asks, did you learn anything from your presentation uh, for the WHO? What do you think their biggest takeaway was? So I gave a talk as part of a conference. Um, and so one of the interest, cool things now is we can do these online conferences. So as people from all over the world, I think there were 70, uh, 700 people who were there for my talk. And I remember 70% of them were uh, government or NGOs, 30% uh, were academics or scientists. So most of the audience for this right now, scientists are doing the work, but we're trying to share it as ethically and efficiently as we can. Um, I think the biggest takeaway they have is, they, they told me they do not have almost any expertise in social behavioral sciences. The World Health Organization has, deals with virologists, epidemiologists, medical doctors, uh, public health officials, they don't have expertise in the area, for example, where psychology is. And so what they want is to basically up their game very quickly around this. Um, I, I was reading a report from, uh, that came out of Harvard Medical School uh, last year, and then it came out, a similar point was made in a medical journal, The Lancet recently, that it doesn't matter what medical research you do, if you don't have a way of communicating it effectively, um, it's going to be problematic. And so I'll just give you the example of the anti-vaccination community. Um, even before this pandemic hit, there are huge swaths of the country who won't vaccinate themselves or their children. Um, they don't trust the Center for Disease Control. And if we didn't have vaccinations, we would basically just be living in current ongoing pandemics uh, with polio and measles. And so that information is lost to young people. Um, I, I talked to my mom about it and she had kids who were severely uh, um, compromised by polio and things like that, um, losing their ability to walk and things. So she remembers it. Um, that memory is lost among large swaths of the population. They didn't have to live through periods where we didn't have herd immunity. And then of course, it's people who have compromised immune systems that can't get the vaccines who are often thrust into the most risk. And so uh, those medical articles suggested that figuring out how to communicate science is just as important or more important than actually doing the science. And so we think that's where we can help. We're not, again, we're not here to challenge any, we're not armchair epidemiologists with a blog where we're gonna challenge our calculations, no. Um, we're here to try to help them make their science as efficient as possible by finding effective ways to communicate while also supporting the mental health of people going through this. Um, Antonio asked, could you suggest something APA could specifically do to advocate science associated with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, yeah, I mean, it, APA is our main voice to policymakers and has been for many years. Um, APA is well situated because obviously they have uh, relationships with lawmakers. I think that they need to get this message out 
I, I would suggest they probably have two, two points of entry. One is uh, they can talk a lot about mental health. And so APA as well, equipped to talk about the social isolation, stress, support, uh, domestic abuse, um, because they're loaded with clinicians and clinical experts. Um, but APA also funds and supports a lot of science. And so I think they also have a key role to play as a trusted representative for this type of work. A lot of the authors in this paper were psychologists, um, so, you know, from different areas of psychology, everything from clinical psychology to cultural psychology, personality psychology, social psychology, cognitive psychology, as well as other fields. Um, so I think APA could be a kind of clearinghouse for the best possible information. And if they could find ways to get into the hands of governors and uh, the White House in a way that they can communicate it, I, I think that that would be uh, helpful. Again, anything, none of these things are silver bullets. This is not, nothing we have to offer is equivalent to a vaccine. Our goal is to, you know, help 2% here, 4% over here, 5% here. Those are kind of the effect sizes in psychology. But if you start adding those up, you can start mitigating and flattening the curve. And so that's, that's what our goal is to do, is to get the information that helps a little bit here and there just to buy us time to save lives, to, to, to mitigate hospitalization visits, mitigate damage to the economy um, by finding ways to help people through this. Um, Terry notes, moral injury, moral injury would be common experiences for providers. What can psychologists do to mitigate these effects? Um, what, I, I'm not sure I know what moral injury means. Do you mean they have to compromise their values? Um, and, and I'm gonna assume that that's what you mean, Terry. Um, that is gonna be a huge challenge. I don't even think we have something in, we actually, we do have a section on that in the moral decision-making section. One thing we talked about is the need to maintain trust in medical and clinical practitioners. And what we said, if there are gonna be um, medical decisions, for example, about how to allocate ventilators, um, we suggested that administrators or government officials need to make those decisions so that the psychological burden and pushback from patients doesn't fall on doctors. Um, and, and they're not constantly burdened with those, the weight of those types of decisions. So that's something that they should obviously be huge stakeholders in those decisions, um, but it shouldn't have to fall on them with every single patient they face. So that I think is one thing that is key. Um, Julia says, letters to young scientists in my favorite column in Science Magazine. How did you get involved in this ongoing project? So I, I have to say by background, I also read an advice column to early career scientists in Science Magazine, uh, along with four friends who are columnists. And basically it was uh, my friend June Gruber, who's a clinical psychologist and I were sharing tips about resources for mentoring. And we decided it'd be helpful for young people to have a mentoring column. A lot of young people, especially people who are at lower ranked programs or don't, aren't getting the mentorship they deserve from their advisors, um, can benefit enormously from people who have those insights and wherewithal and connections. And so we decided that if we're gonna do this, we wanna do it at a very high level of quality for a big audience. Um, unfortunately, with social media, there's also a lot of misinformation about how to do good science and advance your scientific career. And so we wanted to uh, get a, a group of people we really respected from different fields, different career stages, uh, different backgrounds, gender, ethnicity, um, who could speak to a broad audience who were successful academically. And then what we do is we all select column ideas, uh, write them together as a team, and take turns taking the lead on it. And we also have editors, because science has a high quality control. So they help us select topics. And they do a lot of editing, hands-on, multiple rounds of revision. And so that ensured that we're not just, you know, writing a blog with one person's thoughts on how to be a successful young scientist. We have a very curated, highly edited uh, column, um, which can make it a bit dull because it's a compromise, but we also think it is going to have more standing, uh, hopefully more. It'll be, we, we, our editor likes to say they're, we're aiming for evergreen columns, columns that you could read a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, and they'll still be useful to young people. And I find that when I have young uh, scientists in my lab or my classes, and they ask how to get into graduate school, I can send them a column that I've written with links, advice that's curated and edited and that they can read it and, and share it with others. So that was also the goal is to make mentoring kind of a foundational level of advice and knowledge uh, kind of more standardized so people don't fall through the cracks, especially we find that, you know, first generation students and, and students without the social networks are the ones who are probably face those challenges of getting good advice the most. Um, Dorothy notes, 
can you put the title up again at the end so we can share it with others who could benefit from it? Um, that's great advice. That's advice I always hear at my talks, but I always uh, forget to do is you want to give the title <laughs> and stuff on the last slide, not just acknowledgements. Um, so this is the title. If you do a Google search, um, you can find the paper. Um, also, I'm happy to share the slides. I have a, a slide share link um, with all these slides when I gave this talk to the World Health Organization. So if you type in this title or my name and slide share, um, you'll get that, be able to download all the slides. If you want to share them or read them, uh, you're welcome to do it. I try to make all the content as open as possible for, to help people and make it as transparent as possible. Well, Jay, this is Terry Keen, and I want to just extend my deepest appreciation for your spending time with us here today at the APF and for all of the remarkable work that you're doing and in initiating worldwide. Uh, running major cooperative studies across continents is a huge challenge, but it sounds like you're up for it. So uh, good luck with all of that and um, our very best wishes to you. We'll look forward to um, having you back some other time to uh, tell us a little bit about the findings from this study. And, um, and let, again, let me just express my deepest appreciation to you for um, the work that you're doing, the work that you have done, and for the work that you'll continue to do. Uh, thanks very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Terry. Thanks everyone for joining.